You're my reminder. Now I got I got lots of people looking out for us. That's good. All right. So radical functions. This is our parent graph. Here, every parent graph has key features. Okay. For example, on a parabola, the parent graph was just y equals x squared. And the key feature was the fact that we had 0, 0 as a point, 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. Those are kind of the three key points on the parent graph of a quadratic. On a radical graph, your key points are 0, what? If I plug in 0, what's the square root of 0? 0, 0. 1, what? If I plug in 1, what's the square root of 1? 1, 1. If you plug in 2, are you going to know what the square root of 2 is? How about the square root of 3? But the square root of 4, we do, right? If I plug in a 4, what's my appropriate y coordinate? 2. Okay? How about this? What if I plugged in a negative 1? What's the square root of negative 1? Imaginary, right? I. So I, I'm not going to see anything over on this entire left side. I'm not going to see anything because I can't plug in negative numbers. So for the sake of just sort of giving you the general shape of a radical function, this is it. Your key points are 0, 0, and I'm going to put those here. 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. No one says you have to memorize those. You can do exactly what I just did there. Okay? You kind of plug in 0, 1, and obviously you'll see 2 doesn't work nice, 3 doesn't work nice, 4, and you have a couple of critical points. If you can memorize them and you remember them, awesome. If not, because there's lots of parent graphs, you can just plug in some x values. Okay, so these are the two functions and we graphed the parent function using a table of values. Essentially, that's what we did. We picked some x's, plug them in, plugged them in, and so on. Now we're going to graph g of x after the transformations. Here's g of x. Transformations we're going to discuss with every type of function we look at. So what transformation occurs first? I'm going to go with Jake Hutch. What transformation, here's our parent graph, here's our new graph, what transformation happens first? Shift, stretch, compression, reflection, left, right, up, down, how many? Very good. You start within the function. All your horizontal nonsense is going to happen first. This is plus, so that is a shift, and it's the weird direction of what you would think. So left three. So since it's horizontal, since it's affecting our x-coordinate, we need to take our critical points, and we need to think about where will they be when we shift them left three. That's going to affect which coordinate when you move left and right, when you move horizontally the x-coordinate. Moving things horizontally affects the x-coordinate. So all the x-coordinates are going to go left 3. So it'll be negative 3, 0, negative 2, 1, and 1, 2. I did not touch the y-coordinates at all because that was just my shift left 3. All things left, right, and horizontal affect your x-coordinate only. You can visualize that. Shifting points, left and right, moves the x-coordinate. And what's the next transformation? Kaylee? Down 2, right here with a minus 2. It's after the parent graph, so it's outside of the parent graph, so it's vertical. It's subtraction, so it's a shift. And it's specifically down 2. So when you move vertically, Look at the graph. Which coordinate are we affecting? If we move things up and down, why? So they're all going to be reduced by 2.
And those three points are sort of where we leave off. So I'm going to plot those three points. And kind of envision that shift left down two. And there's my g of x. So I'm going to label the parent one f of x and this one g of x. So C asks for the domain of the parent graph. We've graphed it so that we can look at f of x and look at the domain from a graphing perspective. What's the furthest, what's the smallest x coordinate, furthest left this ever gets? What's the furthest left, what's the lowest x value this ever reaches? Zero. Does that include zero? Yeah, so I'm going to use brackets. Zero, two. What's the furthest right it ever gets? Infinity. Infinity is always used parentheses. Now, from a function rule perspective, look back up here. I should know that whatever's underneath the radical has to be greater than or equal to zero because I cannot take the square root of a negative. So what's ever under the radical, we would set it greater than or equal to zero, and that is already solved for x. The range, on the other hand, again, look at your graph. Range is kind of highest and lowest y value. So what's the lowest y value this ever gets to? Zero. And what's the maximum height it's ever going to get to? Infinity. It doesn't go up very fast, but it does continue to increase forever. Okay? Now, on the other graph, we could just look at it, right, and see. But let's do it differently because you'll be asked multiple choice questions like this where you won't get the picture. We know that from f of x to g of x, we shifted left 3 and down 2. When we shift left 3, does that affect our domain or our range? If we go left. Does that affect our x-coordinates or our y-coordinates? x, when you go left, 3. So we are just going to take the old domain and reduce it by 3. So what's 0 reduced by 3? What's infinity reduced by 3? Still infinity. And the range, because this was shifted vertically down 2, that affects the range. That got shifted down 2, so it goes from negative 2 to infinity. And you can confirm that now on our picture. Look at our x-coordinate. The lowest one is negative 3, goes towards infinity. Look at your y-coordinate. The lowest one is negative 2, and it increases towards infinity. Are we good here? Okay. And one other thing, let's pretend we didn't have any of this, and we only had this function. For your domain, what's underneath the radical, in this case x plus 3, always has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because you can't take the square root of a negative. So whatever's underneath the radical has to be positive or at the very least 0. And then when you solve that, x subtracting 3 from both sides, you get your domain. That x has to be greater than or equal to negative 3. Which in interval notation is this right here, from negative 3 to infinity. So whether they give you it visually or through a function or kind of want you to get at it through transformations, there's a bunch of different ways to determine the domain and range. Okie doke. Any questions so far? Okay. Take a minute, just knowing the, the few things that you know about transformations, and try to decide which graph this would be. Here's what I will do for you. I'm going to sketch the parent graph, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. 
So based on the fact that that's the parent graph, think about which one of these is going to be the graph here. everybody have their choice? Yes? Okay, on the count of three, hold it up. One, two, three. Oh, awesome. It's number one, which is mostly what I saw. Here's the one thing about transformations, and we've talked about it from this perspective, is that horizontal ones happen first. So if you think about this, did you think it was transformed horizontally? Yes, right? It got shifted left, one, two, three, four, Initially, it looked like that. So it got shifted left four. The only one that has a shift left four, by the way, is this one. And then, obviously, it got vertically reflected, so there's your negative out in front. Okay? I did see a couple people chose option four. That's a shift right four, so that would have moved it right four and then flipped it. That would have looked like that. Okay, any other questions on that one? Did anyone not do it via transformations? Did anyone avoid thinking about transformations and still manage to get it? I kind of led you in the direction of transformations. That's the way I wanted you to do it. That was the, that's the intention of the problem. But how else could you do this? Graph what, all four of them, like a guess and check? Yeah, sort of. Do it from the graphical sense. You know that you have the point negative four zero. So go through and see, does negative four zero work for this one? Yes. Does negative four zero work for this one? Absolutely not, right? Because if I plugged in an x of negative four, that would not be good. If I plug in negative four here, I'm going to get negative eight. That doesn't work. If I plug in negative four here, I'm going to get negative eight under a radical. So I'm already eliminating that one. So just based on the fact that the domain is way back at negative four. The only one that that could even work for is option one. Okay? So just a couple different ways of looking at that. Now exercise three. Which of the following values of x does not lie in the domain? Take a second to think about that. Okay, which of the following does not lie in the domain? So on the count of three, we're going to hold up our choice. Which one does not lie in the domain? One, two, three. Good. It's two. Option two. A couple wrong answers, so I will explain. Again, you can only take the square root of numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. So this x minus five has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if you add 5 to both sides to solve that, your domain has to be greater than or equal to 5. This is greater than or equal to 5, this is greater than or equal to 5, and that's greater than or equal to 5. So the only one that does not work is 2. And again, if you didn't do that, you could try plugging them all in. You plug in 6, you're going to get the square root of 1. That's fine. You plug in 5, you're going to get the square root of 0. That's fine. You plug in 7, you're going to get the square root of 2. That's fine. But if you plug in 2, you're going to have the square root of negative 3, and that's not a real number, so that's not in the domain of this function. Do we follow? Okay. On the back, I need to jump to 6. Writing inverses is something we're, like I said, just like transformations, we're going to do with every type of function we come across. The two-step process is to first do what? Switch the x and the y, and then solve for y. Very quickly, how am I going to solve for y here? 
y right now is trapped under a radical. How do I get rid of the square root? Square. So I'm going to square both sides. So I get x squared equals y plus 2. And then get y all by itself. Just subtract 2 from both sides. So I get y equals x squared minus 2. Now, one thing I want to make clear. On my original, what was the domain? x had to be greater than or equal to x plus 2 has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if I subtract 2 from both sides, x had to be greater than or equal to negative 2. That means on my inverse function, which I'm going to write f inverse equals x squared minus 2. If the original function had x needing to be greater than or equal to negative 2, what does that mean for the inverse function? y has to be greater than or equal to negative 2. Does this make sense? Remember, all things x and y change. If, I'm going to think about my parent graph for a second. It got shifted how? Left 2. So my domain was negative 2 to infinity. What was my range? My y's had to be what? Greater than or equal to 0, right? Aren't they all my y coordinates above the x-axis or on the x-axis? So if the range for the first one had to be y is greater than or equal to 0, then the domain for the inverse is that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Do you remember all these things about inverses? Flip-flopping the x's and y's, flip-flopping the domains and ranges, and so forth. So let's graph the original. Shifted left 2. Just gives me that. And before I graph the inverse, I want to go to this question down here. This is, this is deeper stuff. You got to really understand this. What was a one-to-one -one function? Something that passed the what? Name. And, right, a function alone passes the vertical line test. A one-to-one -one function passes the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So a quick reminder there. Is this a one-to-one -one function? Does it pass both? Yes. Okay. So there's a reason I went back and looked at the domain and the range. Because if I were to just graph this inverse, the parent graph is a parabola. Agreed? But the parabola has been shifted how? Two to the right would look like this. Because that's within the function. This is happening after the function, so it's vertical. It got shifted down to. So my graph does something like this. But, because my domain and range in the original are limited, my domain and range in my inverse had to be limited. In my picture that I just sketched, are all my y values greater than or equal to negative 2? Good. Are all my x values in my parabola greater than or equal to 0? They are. This, these have x values that are less than 0. So we actually are not going to include this part of the graph because our domain had to be limited based on the fact that the original function's range was limited. Now by erasing that, when you look at the picture, what sort of symmetry do you now see? Reflected over what? Nate? y equals x. Remember how all inverses are supposed to be reflections over this diagonal line y equals x? 
That wouldn't have appeared to be true if I graphed the entire parabola. Are you with me? The parabola's domain and range had to be limited based on the original function's limitations. So a, a lot going on there, good connections to be made and good review to see. Let's jump back up to exercise four, determine the domain, show an inequality that justifies your work. We've done this three times already today. What inequality am I going to write for part A, do you think, John? Okay, you didn't need to solve it all at once. The, just this, right? What's under the radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. Then solve it, and that gives you your domain. Excellent. Same thing here. 3x minus 2 has to be greater than or equal to zero. Solve it. Last one, 8 minus 2x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Solve it, and that gives you your domain. Do we get that? Do we know why it has to be greater than or equal to zero? Because otherwise we would get what kind of a number? Imaginary, good. Okay. And then at the top, what do you think of this function? Why is it a little bit trickier? It's a radical function, but a quadratic underneath. So when we set up our domain, and I'll do it at the top, x squared plus 4x minus 12 has to be greater than or equal to 0. That's a little bit different than anything we've done so far. Okay, let me look at this function on my calculator. I'm going to graph this, y equals x squared plus 4x minus 12. You tell me, when is this function greater than or equal to 0? When is it positive? It's another way of saying that. When is it above the x-axis? That's another way of saying that. Go ahead, Isaiah. Yep. And from negative infinity up until negative six, yep. Guess what? That's our domain for this graph. Well, what's that gonna look like then? Okay, that's our domain for this radical function. It's only going to exist from 2 to infinity and from negative infinity to negative 6. So let's look at the actual function. That's what part A wanted us to do. Square root of x squared plus 4x minus 12. Two different parts. One from negative 6 shooting up towards the left and one from positive 2 shooting up towards the right. Do we see it? Yes? We can also look at the table and look at, oh, I, don't, I want my tables to count by one. And we can start at 2, 0. So start at 2, 0. And then we shot up towards the right. And we start, look what happens if you're less than 2. Right, because that we went from two to infinity and negative two to negative six. Error, error, error. That's because the graph doesn't exist in there. It doesn't start existing again until negative six, zero, and going that way. And we already did part B. Set up and solve a quadratic inequality that gives us that domain. We took what was under the radical set it greater than or equal to zero. And we cheated on our calculator. We haven't actually solved quadratic inequalities other than knowing, okay, when is it positive? When is it above the x-axis? Which obviously Isaiah was able to tell me. That's how you will solve quadratic inequalities if you ever see them. Look at a graph. If it wants to know where they're greater than zero, look where it's above the x-axis. Or it's less than zero, you would just look below. So we'll solve them with that visual way. Listen, your flashcard quizzes, quizzes yesterday were not good. So just as a heads up, I'm right about the point where I'm just going to start giving you a flashcard quiz every single day until you light a fire under you. And then maybe like Average of them will go on as a test grade as opposed to a test.
10% of your grade, it'll be 50% of your grade. So learn them. 